masters who have worked for the upliftment of mankind even today you are here amongst us and many other gurus are there still india is in such a bad state why india is the way it is right now because still it's in god's hands unless you take it into your hands and do something meaningful in this country it will remain this way or get worse Now, if you really are concerned about the national situation or your social situation, it's very, very important that you take it into your hands in a committed way and really do something about it. Some time ago, when I was just 15 years of age, I happened to read this passage by Swami Vivekananda. He said, give me one hundred people who are truly committed, I will change the face of this country. It made me feel so ashamed. In such a large country, couldn't he find hundred people committed for what all of us want? A man like Vivekananda doesn't come every day. When he comes, he could not find one hundred people. What a shame it is. Not for him, for us as a nation. Since that day I thought, at least as a tribute to Vivekananda, we must create 100 truly committed people. And today I can say very proudly, and it's a very joyous for me to say this, that today we have hundreds of people who are truly committed to make this change happen. The change is beginning to happen, but not enough. It is not enough. What I see is hundred people are not enough. Today we need a million people who are really committed. Only then something really worthwhile will happen in this nation. All of you who are here today, I request you, beg you and plead with you that in whichever capacity you can, in whatever sphere of life you are, please commit yourself to create a beautiful situation in this country which is a part of this world anyway. Please do that. Because without this commitment, thinking, people are saying this is all divine plan. Because your stomach is full, you can talk this kind of philosophy. If you had your stomach empty, you would have your own plan to get your food. Isn't it so? Now life is comfortable for some people. Those people are saying it is all divine plan. Now, once you have taken one part of your life into your hands, you cannot leave another part to somebody. See, for example, one big bane in this country right now is the huge population. This is not divine plan. This is just irresponsible reproduction. That's what it is. This is not divine plan. With the help of medical sciences and so many other systems, you have taken your death to some extent into your hands. When you take your death into your hands, you must also take your birth into your hands, isn't it? When we have taken death into our control, should we not take birth also into our control? Now, you want death to be in your control, but you want birth to be in God's control. This will not work. Leave both to his control, he will maintain the balance. Once you have taken one, you better take the other also. The calamity that you see in this nation is not because of divine plan. The calamity is callousness of human beings. The calamity is non-committed way of existence. The calamity is irresponsible way of living. That is the biggest calamity. You said that calamity right, there is no calamity. How to love people 
who irritate us the most. <laughs> How to love uh, people who irritate you? Don't pretend to love them. Just understand that they are irritating you. Why they are irritating you? Simply because they are not the way you expect them to be. They are not the way you want them to be. And you also in the same breath claim that you believe in God. If you believe in God, the person who irritates you also happen to be a creation of God. And he seems to be such a masterpiece that he can just irritate the hell out of you. <laughs> Isn't it? So, don't deceive yourself. Just see, irritation is happening because you have held as what is right and what is wrong. You have decided. This is the right way to be. If there are some other way, they will irritate you first, then you will get angry, then you will hate them, then you will want to kill them. <laughs> These are all natural processes. Simply because you are expecting everybody in the world to be like you. If everybody in the world were like you, could you be here? In your own home, if there was one more person like you, could you live in that house? Would it be possible? It's very good that everybody in the world are the way they are. Any human being you take here, this whole mass of people, they're absolutely unique, isn't it? Yes? They're absolutely unique. The per person who is sitting next to you right now, if you look at them, you will see there is no other human being like this person anywhere in this planet. There never was one there never will be one. This is an absolutely unique human being. If you recognize that there is only one like this, it is such precious material, how can it irritate you? Absolutely unique human being who is sitting next to you, please see, just turn around and see people sitting next to you are absolutely unique human beings. There isn't another one like that. And it is such a miracle for you that today you are sitting next to this human being who is absolutely unique, never before, never again on this planet. Where is the question of irritation? You are blind, that is why you are irritated. You are simply blind to life. You have not opened your eyes and looked at life, that is why you can be irritated. Otherwise, how can anybody irritate you? What is the difference between mind and Atma. Oh. <laughs> Which Atma are you talking about? What Atma have you experienced? Mind, you know the function of the mind to some extent. Atma, what do you know? Once again you are talking about stories that other people told you. We can tell you any kind of story but please do not talk about things which are not in your experience. The moment you start talking about what is not in your experience, to put it very bluntly, you are just lying to yourself, isn't it? Yes? If you are talking about things which are not in your living experience, are you not lying to yourself? Yes or no? So don't talk about Atmas, about mind, we can see. Atma, you cannot see right now. Does it mean to say it does not exist? It does not matter whether it exists or not. It is not in your experience right now. So if you want to experience anything beyond physical nature, obviously you cannot experience it with five sense organs. You must have a way of perceiving life beyond the five sense perceptions. That's what yoga means. Yoga means raising your perception beyond the physical so that you can experience that which is not physical. Only when you experience that which is not physical, we can say you are spiritual. Not because you believe this or that, you are spiritual. Not because you go to the temple, mosque or church, you are spiritual. You will become spiritual only when the realm of your experience transcends the physical reality and you have started experiencing that which is not physical. Let's not give names to that. Let us just see, right now it is not in our experience and let's create a longing that we want to know life beyond the present limitations of life, naturally uh, there will be a way to know this. Sadhguru,
Someone is saying that he has met many jnanis, some of whom have attained to samadhi and he has taken diksha from them. He doesn't feel that it has made any significant impact on his life. His question is whether it is necessary for him to attend your programs. Would that make any difference? Obviously. Now, don't think that you met many jnanis is not a qualification. It's a disgrace that you met so many and still you did not allow it to happen. That means wherever you went, you failed. That's what it means. You met many people who even attained samadhi and still nothing happened to you means please don't carry it as a qualification or a badge on your shoulder. It's a disgrace because nobody could awaken you because you must have been going to those places like a stone. I want you to understand now that if it has not worked, definitely it's time that you make one more attempt. We have many hard ways for hard nuts, soft ways for soft ones. So if you are a hard nut, we have ways for you. You please come. <laughs> In modern life, we are going through enormous stress. Can Isha Yoga help us come out of this? <laughs> now, uh, it is not a question of modern life or ancient life. Whenever people are in a state where they have no control over their inner situations, they will be naturally stressful. It is not because of external situations that you are stressful. It is just that your inner situations, your mind, your body, your emotion and your energy is not in control. That is why you are stressful. Definitely Isha Yoga will do miracles for you in that direction. There are so many gurus today. All are claiming different things in the name of liberation. How can I know who is the right guru for me? <laughs> I am not claiming anything. <laughs> Nor do I want to be your guru. No guru, if there is one, is ever desiring to be your guru. Okay? <laughs> guru means, gu means darkness. Ru means dispeller. One who dispels your darkness is your guru. Now, he dispels your darkness not because he desires to be your guru. He dispels your darkness because he has the necessary light within himself. Now, your question is, okay, there are so many of them. Which one should I choose? This question is like, which soap shall I use? Lux, Hammam, Nirma, which one? <laughs> it's not for you to decide that anyway. Now the problem is, there are so many people in the world today who are just out there to provide solace to people. People are seeking solace, so solace is being offered. Those who offer solace to you, those who offer psychological comfort to you, you don't call them a guru because they are only taking you deeper into your ignorance. If you sit with your guru, if you are very comfortable, he is not your guru. If you sit with him, you feel threatened. Who you are, becomes so insufficient in his presence. Who you are trembles in his presence. Then he is your guru. In his presence, if you are comfortable, he is not your guru because he is only supporting your limitations. He is not threatening your limitations. In his presence, you don't know what to do. He is your guru. In his presence, you know what to do. He is not your guru. In his presence, you don't know what to do, but still everything happens. He is definitely your guru. <clears throat>
this is not something that you judge but right now there is a need to judge because so many of them are coming i don't know how many more people have spoken in the same grounds <laughs> I know every day they're barging into your homes through the television and claiming all kinds of things. Most of the time offering you solace, encouraging your limitations. Anybody who encourages and sustains your limitations, anybody who tries to make you feel comfortable is definitely not your guru. A guru is somebody who threatens you. A guru is somebody who destroys you the way you are so that you can become the way the creator intended you to be. You don't seek a guru, first of all. You create a longing. You create a deep longing to know a guru will happen to you. You don't seek going about choosing which is a better guru. You don't choose. You just create a deep longing. what you call as guru will happen to you because guru is not a person a guru is a certain space a certain energy it can only happen to you it's not somebody you meet it is not somebody that you shake hands with it's not somebody that you bow down to it is not somebody to whom you go and beg for this or that that space that energy which you refer to as guru will happen to you it will overwhelm you it will destroy you the way you are so that you will become unbounded you will become the way creator intended you to be in the name of religion so many conflicts have happened is it necessary to have so many religions can't there be just one universal religion i think we have already answered this question in many ways <laughs> why should there be a universal religion I would like to see there are 7 billion or 6 billion people in the world I would like to see 6 billion religions only then it will work for you because religion is a very intimate process it's an inward process it is not something that you do on the street it is something that you do within yourself we don't need one religion we need billions of religions each individual should see which is the way for him to seek his ultimate nature he need not form a group whether the group is five people or 10 people or million people it has no meaning religion is something that you do within yourself not on the street sadguru what is dhyana how is it different from puja and prayer does practicing meditation bring well being to us the way we want it just like performing rituals does <laughs> there is a catch in the question bring well being to us the way we want this is the problem with people they not only want well being they want well being the way they want <laughs> and they also claim that they believe in god please see the only and only problem with your life right now is life is not happening the way you want it to happen if life is not happening the way you want it to happen if you are a believer in god it must be happening the way god intends it you must be very happy but you are not happy <laughs> your beliefs are so hollow that it is not working <laughs> now what is dhyana if you are in dhyana are you beyond rituals prayer and all these things dhyana means <clears throat> to be beyond the limitations of your body and mind when you exist here as a body as a mind your suffering is inevitable if you are happy 
it's an accident i'm telling you because the process that you refer to as body the process that you refer to as mind is not in your hands it is always subject to all the forces of duality in the existence so you being happy or unhappy peaceful or not peaceful is no more yours it is just the situation which decides this so meditation means to transcend these two limitations of the physical body and the mind so that you exist in that state where the body and the mind are not deciding the quality of who you are right now in this moment to be in meditation means to be in that state to be in dhyana means to be in that state where you are in touch with the source that which is the basis of this body and this mind now what is it that you are referring to as god what is it that you are referring to as the divine what is it that you are referring to as allah and shiva and god and whatever else that which is the basis of all creation that is what you are referring to as god so meditation means to be in that state where you are neither the body nor the mind because body and mind are things that you gathered from outside they are not the basis of life they are only the surface of life the physical reality of the existence is only the peel of the fruit see the peel has no purpose of its own only as a protective layer for the fruit the peel means something for example this moment you are sitting here this body is very important you have to feed this body you have to clothe this body you have to decorate this body you have to pamper this body in so many ways but that something inside this body which you never experienced if that something leaves this body nobody is interested in the body now the fruit is gone nobody is interested in the peel anymore only because the fruit is inside we value the peel but right now you have gotten so deeply involved with the peel that you have forgotten about the fruit if you are eating the peel of life how life can be it has to be bitter but the problem with the peel is it has spots of sweetness in it these spots of sweetness in the peel have come because of its association with the fruit but these spots of sweetness exist right now your whole life is about searching for these spots of sweetness these spots of sweetness have come only because of the fruit if you transcend the peel if you go beyond the peel and taste the fruit your life will become completely different if you keep yourself limited to the peel the physical existence is just the peel of life right now your whole experience of life is limited to the physical existence because everything that you experience in your life right now is only through the five sense organs these sense organs can experience only that which is physical it cannot experience anything that is not physical if we have just come here to eat sleep reproduce and die one day we don't need this kind of intelligence we don't need this kind of body to eat sleep reproduce and die if you had come as an insect or a worm or an animal or a bird you could have fulfilled those things much better than any human being as a human being you are not too good at those things this person once he has come in the human form he has come with a different capability of knowing and experiencing life beyond the physical dimension that's what meditation means to know life beyond the limitations of five sense organs to know life beyond the sphere of that which is physical to know life and experience it at the source not at the surface 
<clears throat> is it not enough for me to pray? Your prayer is just 99% of the time is just an expression of your fear and greed. It has nothing to do with divinity. It has nothing to do with the source of life. It is very much the surface. Things that you don't have, things that you long for, things that you crave for, that is what your prayer is. You are just hoping God will give it to you. You are just hoping that you will earn your life little free. You are just hoping that you will get your life at fair price. <laughs> it's not working, but fear itself is not going. Even peace is not coming into your mind because of this. The difference, the fundamental difference between prayer and meditation or dhyana is prayer means you are making an attempt to speak with God. By now, you must have spoken much. In all these years of speaking, probably you never allowed him to speak. If you don't allow somebody to speak, see you do one thing. <laughs> you go to your friend's house today after this meeting. Sit there for half an hour. You do all the talking. Don't allow your friend to utter one single word. The next time you go and knock on his door, even if he's there, he will say he's not there. If you say ten things, at least if you allow him to say one, there is a possibility of relationship. If you do all the talking, your friend will have nothing to do with you. That is what has happened between you and God. Even though he is very much present with you, he pre pretends as if he is not there. Because he is afraid of you. Because you do all the talking. So meditation means you stop your nonsense and listen. It's not the time for you to speak. You speak throughout the day. For some time in a day, you allow him to speak. Let's see what he's got to say. Are you a Shaivite? Does your path embrace every God and everybody? <laughs> I think before I spoke they wrote this question. <laughs> Are you a Shaivite or a Vaishnavite? You are asking me which group do I belong to? <laughs> I am a kind of person that no group will like. <laughs> because in many ways I am a threat to all groups. First of all, why do you want to form a group? The need to form a group has come within you because as a being you are insufficient. You're feeling insufficient by yourself. This is the reason you have formed groups. Whether the group is family or community or religion or caste or whatever. Any kind of group you have formed because by yourself you feel insufficient. As a being you are not sufficient. You have not found anything within yourself which is of such value that if it sits here it is complete by itself. You have not found anything of substance within you. That is the reason why you are forming a group. That is the reason why you belong to your group. Whether you are a Vaishnava or a Shaiva or you are this or that, the fundamentals, the psychology behind the need to form a group has come because of your insufficiency. You have not felt who you are. You have not bothered to see who you are. You have not bothered to experience what is the nature of your being. That is the reason you have formed a group. Now, my whole work and my life is to help people experience the divine within themselves. If you experience the divine within you, after that, definitely you would not have any need to belong to any group. 
you don't even have to identify yourself as a human being and alienate yourself from the other life forms in the existence you can just exist here as life life is sufficient unto itself you don't have to make saiva out of it you don't have to make vaishnava out of it you don't have to make hindu out of it you don't have to make muslim out of it if you sit here this being is sufficient now people are always struggling with this because they're trying to find value for themselves from outside they're always trying to add value to their life either through education or through the clothes they wear or through the jewels they wear or through the homes that they stand in or through the visiting cards that they carry you are doing all this because somewhere you have not experienced the nature of who you are you have not even made an attempt in that direction so belonging to this group or that group only retards you it doesn't matter which group you belong to it retards you if you are planning to form an isha group <laughs> that will also retard you the very reason carefully we chose a name as isha is isha means formless divinity that you can't identify with it you can experience it but you can't identify yourself with it so the question of belonging to some group or the question of embracing different groups doesn't arise in my mind only if you see them as different the question of embracing arises within you when you don't even see what is sitting in front of you as different from yourself the question of embracing it doesn't arise the very fundamentals of spirituality is just this if you begin to experience everything as a part of yourself then we say you're spiritual how can i experience everything as a part of myself because i am me you are you that's the reality <clears throat> today modern science is proving to you beyond any doubt that the whole existence is one energy there is no doubt about it anymore the same energy is manifesting itself as mud the same energy is standing there as tree the same energy is barking as a dog the same energy is sitting here as you the same energy is what you worship as god <clears throat> this is what modern science says your religions whichever religion you come from they have also been screaming the same thing they have been saying god is everywhere whether you say god is everywhere or everything is one energy is it different it is just that einstein likes to call it e we call it ishwara we are saying everything is ishwara he is saying everything is e it is not different so if everything is that why is it that you not experiencing it that way it is simply because you are deeply enslaved to the process of sense organs the sense organs can experience anything only in comparison with something else only because you have seen darkness you can feel the light that's the nature of your eyes only because you have heard a situation where there was no sound now you can hear the sound if i feel this i feel this is cool only because my body is warm i can feel the coolness of this steel rod everything that you experience through the sense organs is only in comparison with something else so once you are enslaved to the sense perception once your experience of life is limited to the sense perception naturally you experience the world fragmented into million pieces you don't see the oneness of the existence now if you transcend your sense perception naturally you feel and experience everything as a part of yourself once you experience everything and everybody as a part of yourself after that nobody has to tell you how you must live here nobody has to teach you to be good see from the moment you are born people are teaching you moralities be good be good 
don't harm this person, don't kill that person, don't rob that person. Suppose you experienced all the people who are here as a part of yourself, does somebody has to teach you such morality? Is there a need for such morality? So that is what spirituality means. If you have tasted anything which is beyond the physical limitations, you cannot belong to any group. See, that which is everywhere, with what will you compare it with? Once you have no comparison, you cannot experience through the limitations of sense perception. You can see it this way. Once it so happened, there was a philosopher fish. What? A fish a philosopher? Yes, a philosopher fish. See, everybody is a philosopher. Please look at yourself. You are also a great philosopher. There is a drunkard on the street. You stop him and ask him why he is a drunkard. He has a great philosophy as to why he is drinking. Yes? Is it so? You stop a thief and ask him why he is a thief. He has a solid philosophy as to why he is into this. Everybody has solid philosophies to support whatever nonsense they are doing in their life. Without a philosophy, you cannot continue your nonsense. Please see. If you have no philosophy, you cannot sustain your nonsense. At every moment, you have to become aware. At every moment, you have to think, why should I do this? But once you have a philosophy, you can just continue your nonsense endlessly. So there is a philosopher fish. One day he is sitting in one place, very miserable, in great distress. Another fish came this way, looked at this philosopher fish and asked him, Philosopher, why are you sitting like this? You seem to be in great distress. What is the reason for your misery? The philosopher fish said, Don't bother me. I am in real trouble. What is your trouble? Please tell me. The philosopher fish said, Wherever I go, people are talking about oceans. I wanted to see the ocean, so I traveled in every direction possible, but I don't see the ocean. Where is it? Now the problem is, he is also a part of the ocean. That's the problem. If he was outside the ocean, he would have gone and seen the ocean. Now that he is a part of it, he has no way to perceive it. Right now, your problem with divinity, your problem with God is just this. You are breathing it, you are eating it, you are walking upon it. So you don't know. You don't know how to perceive because your perception is limited to five sense organs and it needs a comparison, it needs a background, it needs a foil, otherwise it cannot experience. Da-da-da! <laughs>